And amen. Glory be to God. What a blessing it is to be here at Bethel Worship Center International. Amen. Ain't nothing like worship. I love worship. So worship is my thing. So we're glad to have that opportunity to come here and share with you all today. Um, we are trying to be a blessing to our brother, Her Pastor Herman, and his wonderful wife. We've known them for some quite some time, and they've always been a blessing to us, and we love them very much. And so whatever they have need of, um, we're willing to support and supply. Amen? Whatever they can, whatever we can do to help, we're here to help. So we thank God for this opportunity. I want you to do something with me. I know we don't want to uh, belabor a long time, but I want you to do something that we, we, we do at Lighthouse Assembly of God, <clears throat> something we do both on our um, live stream and both we do in our in-person service. And so if you have your Bibles, grab, take your Bibles. If your Bible's on your phone, grab your phone. And once you hold your Bible up in the air, I'm right-handed, so I hold it in my right hand. If you're left-handed, you know, we'll, we'll accept that too. <laughs> hold your Bible up in the air. And let's say this proclamation. You know, it's good to prepare your hearts for what God is going to do. It's good to open your heart to receive the word of the Lord. So we have a little proclamation we make to try to prepare our hearts for the things that God's going to speak to us. Amen? Amen? So this is how it goes. I'm going to do it piece by piece, slowly, so you can follow along. This is God's word, is God's word. And, how he to me. and how he speaks to me. My heart is receptive. My, heart is receptive. My mind is clear. My ears and eyes are open. My ears and eyes are open. And I am ready, I am ready to, hear to hear and to do, and to do all, that all that is required of me to walk in the likeness of Christ. To walk in the Christ. Amen. 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 So as many as receive that. We want you to take that as your sign that God is getting ready to do something tremendous. Amen? Amen. All right. Once again, this is a day that the Lord has made, and I don't know about nobody else, but I made the decision early this morning that I was going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Because this is another day, and every, uh, old man told me a long time ago, every day above ground is a good day. So I thank God for this opportunity to share the word of the Lord with you today. And we're uh, going to be coming from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. I'm reminded years ago, many, many years ago, before I started pastoring a church, the church that I was that I were, was a member of, Living Word Tabernacle, Assembly of God. The pastor had a family emergency. I got a call that Sunday morning, and the pastor asked me to bring the word. Now, I didn't bring the word every Sunday, so, you know, I, I actually had a lot prepared. You know, it's different when you, <laughs> when you don't get an opportunity to speak that much. You got a whole lot, and, you know, sometimes it can, can go long. When you get an opportunity to speak every week, 52 weeks a year, you get kind of, you know, all right, you start giving out piecemeal because you say, well, let me save some for next week. But I was just blessed and so uh, honored to be invited to speak on behalf of our past, Pastor Dixon. And I was just as blessed and honored to be invited to speak by my pastor that particular Sunday morning, even though it came suddenly, that Sunday morning I was preparing to come to church and found out I was going to be ministering the word. And this was sudden, but I tell you what, <laughs> I consider it a great honor and a privilege to be your speaker today. Mark's Gospel, the 10th chapter, and I'm glad you all have this custom of standing for the reading of the word. Chapter 10 the Gospel of Mark, and verse 
46 is where we're going to start. You all are very probably very familiar with this story of this passage of scripture. Verse 46. And the word of God says, And now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples a great, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, now I, I like to dramatize the word. Let me, this, is what, this is what happened. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, some of that, that if that disturbed you, you're in the right place today. You're in the right place today. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, mm, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless us to receive strength from it today. Lord, help us, O oh God, to receive what you would have speak to our hearts today in Jesus name we give you all the glory all the honor and all the praise amen and amen you may be seated in the presence of the Lord God is good on today the scripture says Jesus came to Jericho and left Jericho and if we're not prepared for his presence, he will come and go, and we won't be able to receive anything from it. Amen? Amen. The scripture says he came to Jericho and left Jericho. Jesus. But on that leaving, on that departure from Jericho, there was one blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. And he was willing, uh, he was willing to reveal his emptiness he was willing to endure the persecution for admitting he had a need Amen. it's not like that so much today we have been taught that if you're a Christian you got the victory and you are gonna overcome and all this stuff and you have to have a positive attitude and you believe it and receive it and name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and all those things that we think is required of us as Christians and very, very few of us, if any, will ever come to church and identify that we're in trouble. Now, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to meddle on uh, nothing or anything today, but I want to tell you that there have been a lot of times that people come to me to tell me they've decided to get a divorce. That it's already water under the bridge. But they don't come to say, Pastor, we, we've been struggling. We, we, ain't been, we ain't been on the same page for three months now. I'm hurting, she's hurting. We need your help. Could you talk to us, counsel us? No, they wait until, you know, the bridge is broken. And then they come to declare their next move. Because people have been 
brought into this false idea that we have to be perfect, that we have to be super saints, that we can't come to church and be real. Amen? And I know you've heard it before, but I'm going to tell you again, and it's a good exercise to do every Sunday. Look at your neighbor and say, take your mask off. It ain't Halloween yet. <laughs> take the mask off. One blind man was willing to uh, uh, reveal his emptiness. He was willing to endure the persecution for admitting that he had a need. Bartimaeus, the scripture says, Bartimaeus heard the crowd. Thank you, God. God always gives us something to work with. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful for that because Bartimaeus heard the crowd. He couldn't see, but he could hear. So he used what he had. He couldn't see, but he had good vocal cords. So he used what he had. So when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out for mercy, for mercy. See, Bartimaeus had been contemplating his condition and cultivating a spirit of desperation. Mm. His plea for mercy was a cry of desperation. A desperation for deliverance. So I have a question. What more has to happen in your life for you to get desperate for Jesus? What more will it take for you to come to that place of desperation? I'm going to tell you right now, refusing to quit or to give up is a sign of desperation. Oh, when you get to the place where you can't sleep, where you're waking up way before dawn and, and you, you don't know what, why or what's going on, but you're just not comfortable and you, you feel in a place of desperation is starting to set in. You can't eat. You turn over your plate. Glory be to God. Uh, Sometimes turning over the plate means more than just stop eating food. You, 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 you don't want nothing. Can't seem, nothing can't seem to satisfy. Nothing can't seem to uh, fill the gaps. Nothing can fill the hole that you're filling in your heart or filling in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you get to the place where you come into the house of God. I never, years ago, I had a season of backsliding in my Christian walk. And I stopped going to church. I had been saved a while. I had been saved about four or five years. And I just, see, what, see I can tell it this from, ex, from experience. This ain't something I learned in a book. Backsliding ain't no big blowout. It's a slow leak. And so what happens is you're sitting right there in the church and you're starting to slip. You're sliding. Sometimes and most of the time it's because you're not willing to admit you got a problem. You're holding on to stuff. You're hiding stuff. And nobody knows about it till it's too late. You're sliding out. So I stopped going to church, and I remember my wife told me this, and we, we've talked about, discussed the situation over the years. And she told me how she, when she would go to church, she had to go to church by herself, her and the kids, her and my kids and stuff, they'd go to church by themselves, because daddy wasn't going to church. She used to go to the altar every Sunday. She would stand at the altar every Sunday for her husband. You know, sometimes as a minister, as a pastor, you get a little concerned when somebody comes and does the same thing every Sunday. Because you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I prayed for you and I've been laying hands on you and sisters green jeans and brother, you know, black suit done prayed for you and, and everybody laid hands on you. and We've been praying now. It's been, what, three months, four months? You still coming to the altar? It had gotten to the place 
where they were threatening to throw Bartimaeus out the church. Have you ever got so desperate for the Lord that you were willing to be thrown out the church? Oh, glory be to God. Because <laughs> you can't stop calling on his name. You can't stop calling on You can't stop going to the altar. You can't stop praying. You can't stop believing God for a change. You need, desperately, you need something to happen. And you won't give up. And you won't give in. And you won't stop until God moves on your behalf. The woman said, I'm not leaving this place till you bless me. And the Bible says, and they charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal more. Hallelujah. See, he said, before I take it back, I'll add more to it. He began to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. It was a cry. It was this cry that stopped Jesus in his tracks. My God, the scripture says, and Jesus stood still. How many know that it's a truth? I, I, I'm not vouching for the singers. I'm not vouching for the artists that made it. But I tell you what, the words, the verse of the words in the song is a truth. Where Jesus says, yes, can't nobody say no. <laughs> Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Those who had told him to shut up now said, be of good comfort, rise. He's calling you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how fast people can change when they think it will make them look more spiritual? If they had really cared about Bartimaeus, they would have taken him to Jesus themselves. Hallelujah. I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but this is the part I like. Mark 10 verse 50 says, and he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me let me take a moment. And just praise the Lord for that right there. I love that part right there. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He cast away his garment and came to Jesus. This garment is, it was symbolic of his life and his lifestyle. Hallelujah. He had lived in this garment the life of a beggar, a blind beggar. It, it represented all the restrictions and limitations and impossibilities of his life. It symbolizes the, the mental disposition that, that held him captive and defined and determined all of his actions. This coach said, I'm blind, therefore I cannot do for myself and provide for myself. Therefore, I am a beggar. Oh, hallelujah. My life, my existence is determined by the generosity or lack of generosity of those who have sight. I wonder today how many are spiritually blind to the things of God and therefore they have become beggars in the kingdom. There are many who know nothing about the spirit of revelation, about receiving a revelation from God and about how truth can quicken and be made alive inside of you and in your, within your spirit. And something comes off, the word of God jumps off the page. They are like many who, who like the Israelites, chose to live as blind beggars. Who chose to receive everything secondhand? They said, Moses, Mo, we ain't going through that no more. When he stood, God came down on Mount Sinai and spoke audibly to them, they could hear his voice. They said, Mo, we don't want that no more. You go listen, talk to him, and come back and tell us what he said. 
They chose to live and receive everything secondhand. Many in the church today are blind by choice. Because to see carries the responsibility of change. Listen, the scripture says, Jesus said, if you would be my disciples, first your intention is to be my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. The implication is that you, what the truth that you know makes you free. And I always have to remind people and emphasize, he said, make you free. He didn't say set you free. There's people who even today probably be set free from prison. But they're still in prison in their mind. And so it won't be long before they go back there. Why? Because they was always in there in the first place. They never were made free. They were set free. But the truth, Jesus said, the truth that you know, not truth that you heard or truth that you, somebody else knew that they told you about, but the truth that you know will make you free. But freedom has a burden. Glory be to God. See, that's why not many people want to be entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship requires a certain freedom. Freedom to do what? To choose. You got to decide when you're going to get out the bed. You don't have somebody else who's already scheduled your day for you. You got to decide what you're going to do to be productive on that day. All oh, glory be to God. I see somebody getting that right now. See, some people ain't ready. For, some people don't want that kind of freedom. They want, to be, they want to have somebody preparing the meals and somebody else to, who going to set up the schedule for the day and somebody else who's going to dictate when they go to bed and when they get up. So the children of Israel chose to receive everything from God secondhand. That also gave them a way out to be able to say, well, you said that, Mo. We don't know about all that. I don't know. We, we don't know if he said it or not. You can't even told us that. <laughs> Bartimaeus knew that to receive his sight would end his right to beg. My God, hallelujah. He would now have to labor for himself, and he publicly made that decision. Here's the point. And this, if you don't get nothing else out of this message, get this. What Bartimaeus heard of Jesus called him beyond his condition and convinced him of a fuller uh, life, of a better life. Glory be to God. What he heard about Jesus. See, he couldn't see him and he, probably, he had never been around him before. But when he heard he was coming through, he cried out for mercy because what he heard about Jesus called him from beyond his condition. Mm, mm, mm. This faith in his heart of what he believed, he believed what he heard about Jesus. How many of you believe today? How many of you believe in today? He believed what he heard about Jesus and that faith in his heart created spiritual sight. Still didn't have natural sight, but he had physical sight. He, didn't, he had spiritual sight and he began to see himself well. Glory be to God. He began to see himself healed. He began to see himself no longer a beggar. He began to see himself with sight. And the Bible says, he casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. It says he rose. He stood up. This means he made a decision to be different. He made a determination to be different. He made a declaration to be different. He stood up 
And in standing up, he was leaving the position, come on somebody, that defined him as a beggar. And in coming to Jesus, he was leaving the condition that defined him as blind. Hallelujah. In coming to Jesus, he was stepping into the unknown. I'm almost done, y'all. Every level of growth in the spiritual life, in the life of a believer, requires that you step into the unknown. This is the day that the Lord has made. But guess what? It's not a day you've ever seen before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you woke up, this, when you opened your eyes this morning, you opened your eyes into the unknown. Ah, uh, y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, you know that morning you woke up, you didn't expect for all that to happen. You woke, you woke right up into the unknown. Come on, brother. Pastor Herman, I know you were saying, like, what in the world is this? It's just an ordinary day for me, and then all of a sudden now my whole life done changed. Every level of growth in our lives as believers requires that you step into the unknown. Go and go where you have not gone before and leave your comfort zone. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. That's why when we, we got to know when God calls you, when you receive Christ as your Savior, he doesn't save you to stay the same. He doesn't save you to keep living the life you was living. That old lifestyle, them old club stuff and all that stuff, that you are supposed to be turning away from You're supposed to be having a new life. We're supposed to live in the newness of life. If all you had to do was say a prayer or say a few words out of your mouth and keep on living the way you was living, Jesus should not have had to die on a cross just for that. Shouldn't have had to give his life. For you to just say, okay, I, I'm the dominant, I'm saved now. Keep on living your wicked life. But you have to leave your comfort zone. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. How many, how, how many of you, since you've been saved, you done lost a few friends? If you haven't, something might not be quite right. You might need to check yourself again. Check yourself. Because Peter says they think it's strange that you don't run with the same foolishness that you used to run with them. And they're going to call you some kind of weirdo. Don't worry about it. God will bring them around after a while. A lot of them will be just like old Nicodemus. They'll sneak by your house late at night when ain't nobody around and say, Man, so now what did you say happened? What did you do? <laughs> when God called Abraham, he went out not knowing where he was going. Glory be to God. Some of us won't let nobody put us in a car and drive off and we don't know where we're going. <laughs> where, you go? where we going? <laughs> you get to the door of the car, they say, where, where are we going? They won't even get in the car. He went into the unknown as the children of Israel prepared to cross into the Jordan, across over the Jordan, into their inheritance. They were told as they followed the Ark of the Covenant to leave a space between them and the Ark so they could see which way to go because they had not passed that way before. See, this is the problem. Many of God's people are missing what God has for them because they're not willing to trust him where they can't trace him. That is, if they can't see or make sense of what he is requiring, they refuse to follow it. Number two, because they're not willing to cast away their old garment. Mm. 
Jesus said you can't put new wine into old wine skins or put a new piece of garment onto an old. This means you have to be willing to let go of the old to receive the new. As Elijah's mantle fell to the ground, Elisha took it up. He took hold of it. But before he did that, he tore his own clothes in half. See, what he was doing, he was removing the old to make new room for the new. Come on, somebody. Thirdly, because they are not willing to admit spiritual poverty. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. We should always confess and admit to spiritual poverty. Yeah, we might tell the devil, you know, you, you, know, you ain't got no win with me. You know, you done picked up the wrong one this time because I'm mighty in God. But when we go before the Father, we have to say, Father, I am weak. Father, I, am, I need you desperately. I admit my spiritual poverty. I'm poor in spirit. And the fourth reason why a lot of people miss what God has for them is because they're not willing to change. They would rather be blind than change. They would rather beg than change. But here's the question for you today. Do you want Jesus to stand still where you are? Hallelujah. Are you willing to do what it takes to get him to stand still? It was a cry of desperation. In other words, in, in a more modern way of understanding it, it was a prayer of sincerity. It was a genuine prayer from their heart. It was a praise that was born out of a genuine love and reverence for God. Not words that we repeat like a parrot, but words that come out of our heart. Glory be to God. We love the God. I, I, I even took my time and, and uh, 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 captured that, uh, found out with that, uh, that song, one of the songs you sang, uh, something about living in the overflow. I love that song. I made sure I, I saved that one on my phone. So did. But it's wonderful because some people have really captured our hearts and what we wanted to say so well, so eloquently. But God says, sing a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sometimes you need to make up a song that comes out of your heart to the Lord. Just sing to him. Glory be to God. Some, some of us mothers, some mothers have sang to their children. They made up a song and sang to their babies. That came from their heart. We ought to have a song like that for God. I'm closing. Lord, I thirst for you. Now, I didn't make this song up, but I love it. And I long to be in your presence. My soul will wait. On you, Father, draw me nearer, draw me nearer to the beauty of your holiness, and I will wait for you. Almighty God, in the beauty of your holiness, and I will worship you, Almighty God, in the beauty of your holiness. Leanness in the beauty of 
your holiness in the beauty of your holiness hallelujah hallelujah father we thank you for your word we thank you for the people of god and we pray right now lord hallelujah every one of you who been ministered to by this word that received something that you have felt was like seed that fell on your heart. We pray that it fell on fertile soil in your heart. I want you to just raise your hand. I don't, you know, enough looking around in church trying to figure out who's who. You just raise your hand. If you've been touched by the word of God, I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these whose hands have been lifted, Father God, in response to your word, that you would give them a desperation in their heart for Jesus that would cause him always to stand still and call them to himself. Father God, I pray right now that you would cause them to be able to cast off their old garments, that they would cast off the, the old thing that the enemy had placed over their lives, the old, the old mindsets and the old uh, paradigm, the old stronghold that the enemy had placed over their lives and give them a new perspective, a new life, a new understanding, a new vision, hallelujah, a new dream, hallelujah, a new hallelujah anointing to walk in the truth that you have purpose for their lives. Let them find purpose. Let them find your will for their lives and let that will transform them from what they used to be to what you have purpose for them to be. We give you praise and glory and honor for it even now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you real good. We're going to turn the service. Did you, did you have something you'd like to say? Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord God most high. Thank you so much, Pastor Larry Todd, for that wonderful, wonderful word. That was an awesome word. I needed to hear that word today. Amen. Amen. How many of you all received the word of the Lord today? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord God. We are so excited to be in the house of the Lord. We are ecstatic. Uh, because of what God has done. We have seen him do some things, not just in our lives, not just in pastors' lives. We've seen him do some miracles this week. Um, just just seeing what God did with Pastor Herman, seeing what he did even with a brother-in-law that we had, very similar situation, and now he is doing well. He was on life support. God is amazing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, God. Oh, we bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's so much, so much, so much I want to be able to share. And I will at some point. It's just, I don't know that I can do it right now. But I want to tell you all, thank you all so much. Thank you for everyone just stepping up and doing everything that you've been doing. Everybody online, everybody here, thank you all so, so, so much. Continue to pour in your love. Come on, babe continue to pour in um, and continue to pray. The word for today was being desperate for the Lord. And it doesn't matter what you look like. I think one time I preached about David saying, I'll even get more undignified than this. When you're desperate for God, you don't care what other people are seeing. In that hospital, I didn't care what other people thought of me as I was praying, as they were resuscitating him. I didn't care what I looked like. I didn't care what was going on, but I was desperate 
for Jesus. I was desperate for the Lord to do something. And that is my heart's cry for everyone that's in this place. One thing Pastor Todd said, he said that we want to get to a place where we don't care about what's going on around us. We don't care how many times we come to the altar. We don't care how many times we raise our hand. But it's important for us to keep going after God until we're filled. And even when we're filled, the word says that he'll fill us to overflow. So we don't have to stop there. We just keep going after him until we get the very things that we need. Amen. Amen. I got to be honest because I'm, I, I refuse to be phony. There was a period of time when I was going through this that I thought I would never stand up here again. I understand the meaning now of I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I missed you guys terribly. I love you guys. And there was one particular time when I thought about it. And um, when I saw your face, when I saw several of your faces through your prayers, through your calls, I can't explain to you what it did to me. When I, when I saw a video that Brother Chris sent me of his daughter, Lydia, calling out to God. And several people just praying when my son came. And cousin, everybody just started doing stuff. Whether I knew about it or not, just to know that there was a group of people who had my back. And just to know that I had a wife beside me. Y'all, I'm going to say this in front of everybody. The Bible says, he who finds a wife, I'll make it quick, finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. This woman never left my side. She never left my side from the time she saw me. And I'll tell you all the testimonies later, to the time we walked out of the hospital, she refused to leave. And we made a pact years ago, and I said that if you ever have to leave me while I'm in the hospital, if something happens, I don't care if I'm in a coma or whatever, just put the word on tape. And the one or two nights that they made us not be able to sleep together beside each other. I got a picture of her laying in the hospital bed with me. She brought, she brought me the word. And she stayed in the waiting room. And she refused to leave. People had to bring us stuff to eat. And honey, I love you so much. I love you so much. And so... I'm not going to be before you long, but I know we got to get ready to go. But can you do me one favor? When I stood up here, I thought I would never get to do this again. As we close, and I don't know who's going to do the closing. But when I woke up the second time, my heart had stopped beating. I started singing after I joked a little bit and I started singing. And Brother Mike, if you could just play that song as we close and as we get ready to go out. And I just want you to worship and pray and hug each other and love each other. I, I'm telling you, I, you never know. I wondered whenever I was in the hospital for a little bit, if I would ever get a chance to worship him with believers again. I wonder if I would ever get a chance to believe God with you for something that you was going through. So I just want us to, can we just play one song as we, as we leave? If you want, when you feel led, you can leave on your way out, but just, if you don't mind, I don't, just worship. Brother Mike, 